The concept is perfusion and the exemplar is heart failure. Please make sure that you look at the YouTubes that are on the slides. Here are our learning outcomes to describe the pathophysiology, etiology, clinical manifestations, and direct and indirect causes of heart failure. To identify risk factors associated with heart failure, utilize the nursing process in providing competent nursing care to the patients with heart failure, and to identify therapies used in the collaborative care of individuals with heart failure, and develop an educational plan for patients with heart failure. Your pre-assignment is to write out and define in a concise way each of these terms, and I'll take them up before class. The term heart failure indicates a myocardial disease in which there is impaired contraction of the heart, which is a systolic dysfunction, or an impaired filling of the heart, which is a diastolic dysfunction. It is a complex syndrome resulting from cardiac disorders that impair the ability of the ventricles to fill with and effectively eject blood. Therefore, the heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet the metabolic demands of the body. Heart failure is recognized as a clinical syndrome characterized by signs and symptoms of fluid overload or inadequate tissue perfusion. Myocardial dysfunction and heart failure can be caused by a number of conditions, including coronary artery disease, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, valvular disorders, and renal dysfunction with fluid overload. When the heart begins to fail, mechanisms are activated to compensate for the impaired function to maintain the cardiac output. Systolic heart failure is the most common type resulting from an alteration in ventricular contraction, and it is characterized by a weakened heart muscle. Diastolic heart failure is characterized by a stiff and non-compliant heart muscle, making it difficult for the ventricles to fill. The compensatory mechanisms that are activated improve the cardiac output for the moment, but in the end they result in negative consequences for the heart muscle. Frank Starling's mechanism will increase contractility, which will increase the cardiac output, but it results in an increased cardiac workload. Ventricular hypertrophy also increases contractility to increase cardiac output but it also increases myocardial oxygen demands and results in cellular enlargement. The neuroendocrine response of the sympathetic nervous system leads to an increase in the heart rate, blood pressure, and contractility, venous resistance, vascular return, but all of this increases the myocardial work and oxygen demand of the heart. Lastly, the renin-angiotensin system causes vasoconstriction to pull more blood to the heart, and by doing so, it causes decreased renal perfusion, increased preload and afterload, and by this, ultimately, pulmonary congestion. Ventricular remodeling refers to the changes in size, shape, structure, and physiology of the heart. This can be a physiologic response to exercise in pregnancy or a pathologic response to cardiac injury. The injury can be due to an acute MI, increased pressure or volume overload, chronic hypertension, congenital heart disease, and valvular diseases. Pathologic pressure mismatches between the pulmonary and systemic circulation guide the pathological compensatory remodeling of the left and right ventricles. Remodeling results in a progressive decline in the left ventricular performance and at end stage diminished contractility and reduced stroke volume and pulmonary edema.
physiological remodeling is reversible, while pathological remodeling is mostly irreversible. Acute heart failure is an abrupt onset of heart failure secondary to myocardial injury, such as an acute coronary syndrome or an acute MI. Acute heart failure results in a sudden decrease in cardiac function and signs of decreased cardiac output. Acute heart failure can be reversible with early intervention and aggressive treatment. However, if the heart muscle is significantly damaged, then heart failure symptoms may persist. As with coronary artery disease, the incidence of heart failure increases with age. Approximately 6 million people in the United States have heart failure, and about 550,000 new cases are diagnosed each year. Heart failure is the most common in people older than 75. As the U.S. population ages, heart failure has become an epidemic that challenges the country's health care resources. It is the most common reason for hospitalization of people older than 65 years of age. And approximately 24% of patients discharged after treatment for heart failure are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. The estimated economic burden caused by heart failure in the United States is more than $39 billion annually in direct and indirect costs, and this is expected to increase. Many hospitalizations for heart failure can be prevented by appropriate outpatient care and early intervention to stop the progression of heart failure. Most often, heart failure is a chronic progressive condition which is managed with lifestyle changes and medications to prevent episodes of acute decompensated heart failure. These episodes are characterized by increased symptoms, decreased cardiac output, and low perfusion. The episodes are related to increased or repeated hospitalizations, increased cost of health care, and decreased quality of life for the patient. A low ejection fraction is a hallmark of systolic heart failure. The severity is frequently classified according to symptoms, and there are two classification systems used to classify heart failure. The New York Heart Association classification and the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association classification of heart failure. This system takes into account the natural history and progressive nature of heart failure. Standardized treatment guidelines have been developed for each stage. The New York Heart Association classification has four classes, from no limitations to slight limitations to marked limitations to unable to carry on physical activity without discomfort. American College of Cardiology and the AHA has four stages, patients who are at high risk but without structural heart disease, patients with structural heart disease but without symptoms, and patients with structural heart disease with symptoms, and then patients with refractory heart failure requiring special interventions. This slide shows you the American College of Cardiology and AHA classification with goals and treatments included. So take some time to look at this. As you look at these risk factors, think of which ones are modifiable, or at least somewhat modifiable, and which ones are not. Cardiomyopathy, heart valve disease, myocardial infarction, systemic lupus, erythematosus, congenital heart defects, and type 1 diabetes we can't do much about. But we can sometimes get rid of a, an arrhythmia, and we can possibly improve the status of coronary artery disease. All the others, smoking, tobacco use, alcohol abuse, 
drug abuse, infection, hypertension, and diabetes type 2 are all modifiable with lifestyle changes. There are many clinical manifestations associated with heart failure. Signs and symptoms are related to the ventricle most affected. Left-sided heart failure and right-sided heart failure have different manifestations. Patients with chronic heart failure may exhibit symptoms of both right and left-sided heart failure. This is a good picture to read all of the different effects that heart failure has on the body, but the two most significant are activity intolerance and dyspnea on exertion. This slide shows you clinical manifestations secondary to congestion. Both right and left heart failure experience symptoms of congestion. Uh, Left-sided heart failure refers to the failure of the left ventricle and its result of pulmonary congestion. Pulmonary congestion occurs when the left ventricle cannot effectively pump blood out of the ventricle into the aorta and systemic circulation. The increased left ventricular end diastolic blood volume increases the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which decreases blood volume from the left atrium into the left ventricle dur during diastole. This results in the blood volume and pressure buildup in the left atrium, which decreases the flow through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Pulmonary venous blood flow and pressure increase in the lungs, forcing fluid from the pulmonary capillaries into the pulmonary tissue and alveoli, causing pulmonary interstitial edema and impaired gas exchange. The cough associated with left ventricular failure is initially dry and non-productive. Patients most often complain of a dry and hacking cough, it is important to not mislabel the cough as something else like COPD, asthma, or bronchitis. However, over time the cough may become moist with large quantities of frothy sputum, which may be blood-tinged or either a pink or a tan color. This would indicate acute decompensated heart failure with pulmonary edema. This slide shows you clinical manifestations secondary to poor perfusion and low cardiac output, which both the right and left ventricle also experience. Uh, right-sided heart failure or failure of the right ventricle results in congestion in the peripheral tissues and the viscera. When the right ventricle fails, congestion in the peripheral tissues and the viscera predominates. This occurs because the right side of the heart cannot eject blood effectively and cannot accommodate all of the blood that normally returns to it from the venous circulation. Increased venous pressure leads to jugular vein distension and increased capillary hydrostatic pressure throughout the venous system. Systemic clinical manifestations include edema of the lower extremities and sacral area which is dependent edema, hepatomegaly, which is enlargement of the liver, resulting from venous engorgement, ascites, and weight gain due to the retention of fluids. Anorexia, nausea, or abdominal pain may result from the venous engorgement and venous stasis within the abdominal organs. The patient experiences generalized weakness when the right ventricle fails, with congestion in the peripheral tissues and the viscera. Heart failure may go undetected until the patient presents with symptoms of pulmonary and peripheral edema. Some of the physical signs that suggest heart failure may also occur with other diseases, such as renal failure and COPD. Therefore, diagnostic testing is essential to confirm a diagnosis of heart failure. Assessment of ventricular function is essential in the initial diagnostic workup. So an echocardiogram is performed to determine the ejection fraction and to identify anatomic features such as any structural 
abnormalities, and valvular malfunctions. This information can also be obtained non-invasively by radionuclide ventriculography or invasively by a ventriculography, which is ejecting contrast media into the heart's ventricle to measure the volume of blood pumped. Chest x-ray and EKG are also obtained to assist in the diagnosis. Cardiac stress testing and cardiac catheterization may be performed to determine whether coronary artery disease and cardiac ischemia are causing the heart failure. The lab studies usually performed during the initial workup include electrolytes, bun and creatinine, liver function test, thyroid stimulating hormone, a CBC, and a routine UA. The BNP level is a key diagnostic indicator for heart failure. High levels are a sign of high cardiac filling pressure and can aid in both the diagnosis and management of heart failure. The results of all of these laboratory studies assist in determining the underlying cause and can also be used to establish a baseline to assess effects of treatment. Looking at our concept diagram, we should identify which of the perfusion antecedents are involved with congestive heart failure because the antecedents are the areas that we need to strengthen by our interventions and also to compare our desired attributes, what we want to see in perfusion, with the assessment findings of the heart failure patient. The overall goals of management of heart failure are to relieve patient symptoms, improve functional status and quality of life, and to extend survival. Specific interventions are based on the stage of heart failure. Managing heart failure begins with extensive education and counseling to the patient and the family. Lifestyle recommendations include sodium restriction, smoking cessation, and avoiding passive smoke, avoid excessive fluid and alcohol intake, having weight reduction, regular exercise, and recognize signs and symptoms that need to be reported to the healthcare professional. Several medications are routinely prescribed for heart failure, including ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and diuretics. Many of these medications, particularly the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, improve symptoms and extend survival. Others, such as diuretics, improve symptoms but may not affect survival. Target doses for these medications are identified in the American Heart Association guidelines. Also note that calcium channel blockers are no longer recommended for heart failure patients because they are associated with worsening failure. Angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs, relieve signs and symptoms of heart failure by decreasing the blood pressure and decreasing the afterload. They also can prevent the progression of heart failure. The combination of hydralazine, an arterial vasodilator that relaxes arterial blood vessels, and a nitrate, a venous dilator that relaxes veins, is used for patients who cannot take an ACE inhibitor or the angiotensin II receptor blocker, the ARB, or for patients who need an extra medication to control symptoms of heart failure. The combination is indicated for African Americans with moderate or severe heart failure already taking an ACE inhibitor. Cardiac dysfunction and heart failure is widely recognized as a progressive progress regardless of the clinical signs and symptoms. An increase in cardiac sympathetic drive is one of the earliest neurohormonal responses occurring in patients with heart failure and may be one of the major causes of the progressive remodeling
leading to a decline in myocardial function and also responsible for the poor prognosis of patients with heart failure. Beta blockers combined with diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and digoxin in chronic heart failure class 2 to 4 have been seen to improve the left ventricular function and have a reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations and a decrease in the overall and sudden cardiac death rate. Prior to the administration of the diuretic, we need to check laboratory results for electrolyte depletion, especially potassium, sodium, and magnesium. We also need to check for signs and symptoms of fluid volume depletion, such as postural hypotension or lightheadedness and dizziness. We need to administer the diuretics at a time that is conducive to the patient's lifestyle to avoid nocturia. Monitor intake and output during hours after administration. Monitor daily weight in order to assess fluid gains and losses in response. Continue to monitor serum electrolytes for depletion. Replace potassium with increased oral intake of foods rich in potassium or potassium supplements. We may need to replace magnesium. We need to monitor for hyperkalemia in patients receiving the potassium sparing diuretics. Continue to assess for signs of fluid volume depletion. Monitor the serum creatinine for increased levels indicative of renal dysfunction. Monitor for elevated uric acid levels and signs and symptoms of gout. Need to assess lung sounds and edema to monitor the response to therapy. Monitor adverse reactions such as gastrointestinal distress and dysrhythmias. Encourage supine position after the dose is given to facilitate the effects of the diuretics and assist patients to manage urinary frequency and urgency associated with diuretic therapy. Maybe we need to get a bedside commode for them. Digoxin should be used as a first-line drug in patients with congestive heart failure who are in atrial fibrillation and it should be used as a second-line drug after diuretics, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor, which is an ACE inhibitor, and beta blockers in patients with heart failure who are in the sinus rhythm. These agents are used for patients who do not respond to routine pharmacologic therapy and are reserved for patients with severe ventricular dysfunction. They are used with caution, and the healthcare provider should be aware that they have been associated with increased mortality. IV inotropes are indicated for hospitalized patients with acute decompensated heart failure and are used for patients who do not respond to routine pharmacological therapy and are reserved for patients with severe ventricular dysfunction. IV vasodilators may also be used in patients with severe decompensated heart failure. Uh, patients on these medications usually require admission to the ICU and may also have hemodynamic monitoring with a pulmonary artery catheter, and of course they're going to have a Foley catheter as well monitoring output. Anticoagulants may be prescribed especially if the patient has a history of atrial fibrillation or a thromboembolic event. Antiarrhythmic drugs may be prescribed for patients with dysrhythmias along with evaluation for an implantable cardio defibrillator, an ICD. Medications to manage hyperlipidemia, such as the statins, are routinely prescribed, and patients need to be taught to avoid NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, because they can decrease renal perfusion, especially in older adults. Decreasing dietary sodium reduces fluid retention and the symptoms of peripheral and pulmonary congestion. The purpose of sodium restriction is to decrease the amount of circulating blood volume, which decreases myocardial work. Adherence to pharmacological therapy and diet are important,
as miscalculations may result in severe exacerbations of heart failure requiring hospitalization. Patients with heart failure are at high risk for dysrhythmias and sudden cardiac death is common among patients with advanced heart failure. An ICD may be considered for patients with an ejection fraction less than 35% and with the New York Heart Association functional status of either two or three, including those with and without a history of ventricular dysrhythmias. Patients who are unresponsive with standard therapy may benefit from the cardiac resynchronization therapy. This involves the use of a biventricular pacemaker to treat electrical conduction defects. The intervention improves cardiac output, optimizes myocardial energy consumption, reduces mitral regurgitation, and slows the ventricular remodeling process. This device has resulted in fewer symptoms, increased functional status, and fewer hospitalizations as it helps the ventricles to contract at the same time. Ultrafiltration is an alternative therapy for severe fluid overload. It is reserved for patients with advanced heart failure who are resistant to diuretic therapy. A left ventricular assist device may also be implanted as a permanent therapy for selected patients. Cardiac transplantation is one of the few options for long-term survival. In patients with the American Heart Association Stage D heart failure, who may be eligible are referred for consideration of transplantation. Bridge therapies would include the ventricular assist device. Gerontological considerations for the aging adult are that older patients may present with atypical signs and symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, and somnolence. Normal age-related changes such as increased systolic blood pressure, increased ventricular wall thickness, and increased myocardial fibrosis can increase the frequency of exacerbations of heart failure. Uh, decreased renal function can also make the older patient resistant to diuretics and more sensitive to changes in volume. Administration of diuretics to older men requires close monitoring for bladder distension caused by urethral obstruction from an enlarged prostate gland. And urinary frequency and urgency may be particularly stressful to the older adult as many have arthritis and limited mobility. As we apply the nursing process, we need to get a health history by asking specific questions about increasing shortness of breath, dyspnea with exertion, decreasing activity tolerance, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, the number of pillows used for sleeping, recent weight gain, presence of cough, chest or abdominal pain, anorexia or nausea, prior history of cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, and then what their usual diet and activities would be. We will need to do a physical assessment looking specifically for general appearance, ease of breathing, conversing, changing positions, anxiety, vital signs including apical pulse, peripheral pulses, skin color, temperature and mucous membranes, neck vein distension, capillary refill. We'll assess the presence and degree of edema, heart and breath sounds, ascites, bowel sounds and abdominal tenderness, right upper abdominal tenderness and liver enlargement. Nursing diagnosis for heart failure will include decreased cardiac output, excess fluid volume, activity intolerance, and deficient knowledge concerning a low sodium diet. Planning goals for heart failure patients will sound something like this. Uh, the patient will maintain adequate oxygenation as 
demonstrated by respiratory status, breath sounds, oxygen saturation, and vital signs. Uh, two, the patient will maintain adequate tissue perfusion and myocardial function as evidenced by capillary refill, hemodynamic monitoring, assessment of pulses and vital signs. Uh, the patient will meet the body's energy need through adequate and appropriate nutrition. And lastly, the patient will describe the purpose for each medication prescribed and which symptoms to report. Our nursing interventions will revolve around improving the patient's cardiac output. So nursing care is focused on promoting perfusion, improving oxygenation, and decreasing fear and anxiety. Helping the patient and family to cope with fear is an important component of nursing care. Anxiety secondary to hypoxia is also anticipated and requires nursing interventions. A ventricular gallop is an early sign of heart failure and an atrial gallop may also be present. Crackles are often heard in the bases, but as failure worsens, increasing crackles can fill the lungs. Improving oxygenation decreases the effects of hypoxia and ischemia, and it reduces the cardiac workload. Medications are also used to decrease the cardiac workload and increase the effectiveness of contractions. Measures or interventions taken to relieve the condition of excess fluid volume include assessing the respiratory status and auscultating lung sounds every four hours, monitoring intake and output, taking daily weights, monitoring electrolytes, and recording the abdominal girth every shift. Uh, we need to monitor for anorexia, abdominal discomfort, nausea and vomiting, as well as monitor and record hemodynamic measurements. We need to restrict fluids as ordered, but offer ice chips, hard candy, and frequent mouth care to relieve dry mouth and provoke, promote comfort. Patients with heart failure have little or no cardiac reserve to meet increased oxygen demands. So as the disease progresses and cardiac function is further compromised, activity and tolerance increases. Low cardiac output and inability to participate in self-care activities hinders self-care. Encourage independence within prescribed limits. Organize nursing care to allow for rest periods gives the patient time to recharge and assisting with activities of daily living ensure care needs are met while reducing cardiac workload. Progressive activity slowly increases exercise capacity by strengthening and improving cardiac function without strain. Activity also helps prevent skeletal muscle atrophy and range of motion prevents complications of immobility in severely compromised patients. Diet is an important part of long-term management of heart failure to manage fluid retention. The nurse should discuss the rationale of a low-sodium diet with the patient and ensure patient understanding. Understanding fosters compliance with the prescribed diet. Consult a dietitian to teach and plan for a low-sodium diet and, if necessary, for weight control for a low-kilocalorie diet and provide a list of high-sodium foods. Lastly, we need to evaluate how our patients are progressing toward achieving their goals. So we will evaluate as the patient describes each medication prescribed along with the symptoms that should be reported to the healthcare provider immediately. The patient explains the importance of daily weights and keeps a log along with the importance of recording significant weight gain. Uh, the patient chooses appropriate foods from a menu reflecting a low sodium diet, and the patient modifies daily routine to allow adequate periods of rest and activity.